Okay, so today we're mostly going to talk about abstract expressionism and the different kinds of um, sub-movements, subcategories of painting that fit under it. But first, we're going to talk a little bit about post-war expressionism in Europe. So here when we say post-war, I'm talking about post-World War II. So basically, um, World War II, like World War I, had a profound effect on the art world, right? Which makes sense. Um, again, we have all this destruction, we have all this devastation, it's all unleashed upon the world, and political, economic, psychological realms all impacted by, by the horrors of war. Just like, you know, when we look back and we were talking about the context for things like Dada and Surrealism and we were talking about World War I. Um, but this is kind of on an even greater scale. Uh, we have the horrors of the concentration camps, millions and millions of people are slaughtered there. Um, we have the United States dropping two atomic bombs on Japan, which slaughtered civilians, they were all civilians, uh, with a weapon of the magnitude that the world had never seen. So this was kind of a, an even more amped up level of, of horror and um, devastation that's happening. And then we also have this threat of nuclear attack, which becomes kind of part of the uh, post-war political landscape, right? Um, and is sort of embedded, embedded in the psyche of individual citizens. There's bomb drills, people are building bomb shelters in their backyards. Um, the bomb was out there and it kind of lurked in the minds of the citizenry as this fearsome possibility of something that could happen in retaliation against the United States or that the United States could drop a bomb again. And this leads to the Cold War, right? Which is between the kind of nuclear superpowers of the time, which is the United States and the USSR. Um, and those two entities kind of basically split the world into two spheres of influence that they each held influence over. Um, and and there's, this, there's a lot of tension. That's the whole thing about the Cold War, right? So there's a lot of tension and anxiety that's prevalent in all the, um, all the societal conditions around the world. Okay, the end of World War II also doesn't bring total peace. Um, there's a lot of upheaval, which results in a bunch of different regional conflicts. We're not going to go into all of them, but if you've studied history, there's a lot of things that continue to happen. A lot of fighting continues to happen. And a lot of fighting is, is the result of um, upheaval after World War II. Um, the post-war period is also marked by social and political unrest. Uh, in Particularly, we'll look at it in the United States. So we have the struggles of the civil rights and women's rights movements in the U.S., which also all of that elevates um, and escalates between 1945 and 1980. We see the anti-war movement in response to Vietnam here in the United States. We see the rise of multiple subcultures. We have the beat generation, right? The beatniks, we have the hippies, we then have the punk rock movement. Um, so to quote Bob Dylan, the times they are changing. There's a lot of things happening in the cultural world um, in the United States at this time. Basically, the post-war period in the United States was a time of challenge. We have individuals and groups who are pushing back against the status quo, and this is also true in the art world, right? We often see that the art world mirrors anxieties and things that are happening in society, right, and in the political spheres. In Europe, um, we have what is kind of collectively known as post-war expressionism. This takes many forms and has several different influences. Um, existentialism, the philosophy, is very influential. Uh, cynicism dominates the art world again. The um, sculptor Alberto Giacometti is, is, rises to popularity. Also Francis Bacon, whose work we see here, and Jean de Buffet, who's a French artist who um, is interested in ideas about crudeness, about the crude art, uh, brute art, untrained art, basically. Um, and they're making work that seeks to express feelings of isolation, existentialism, violence, and torture. So this is what's happening in Europe to kind of set up what's going on across the pond. Um, and as I alluded to last time, the capital of the art world starts to kind of shift after World War II. So we'll talk about that when we get into abstract expressionism right now. All right, so if you think back to my surrealism lecture, 
I leave off with Arshile Gorky. This is Arshile Gorky. I don't think that I told you that he changed his name, Gorky, his last name um, isn't his real last name. He changed it to Gorky, which means bitterness in Russian because he had had such a horrible experience. I told you when we talked about him last time that he had to flee the Armenian genocide. Um, his family dies. He has a bunch of terrible, tragic things that happened to him. And he literally makes his name kind of the um, personification, the, the embodiment of his suffering. So Gorky means bitterness. That not, that's not by accident. Okay, so I left off surrealism with Arshal Gorky. He's associated with the um, biomorphic surrealists, which we talked about, but he also leads our way into a new movement that takes root in post-war America, and that is abstract expressionism. The devastation of World War II it, that was inflicted mostly across Europe, and then also, you know, in Japan, uh, resulted in an influx of artists escaping the Nazis and fleeing to the U.S., fleeing to other areas as well, but a bunch of artists coming to the U.S., particularly into New York, um, to try and escape the terror in Europe and try and escape the Nazis. We talked about degenerate art when I talked about surrealism. So artists are literally one of the groups being targeted by the Nazis to be thrown into concentration camps. Also, a lot of the artists at this time, particularly in um, some of the works we looked at, some of the surrealist people are Jewish. As you know, the Nazis were slaughtering Jews as well. So it was a bad time to be an artist in Europe, so we have a lot of artists that come over to America. Um, in the 1950s, the center of the Western art world, because of all these factors, shifts from Paris to New York City. Um, the first major American art movement of the avant-garde in America is abstract expressionism. Okay, uh, one of the key figures who plays a role in abstract expressionism and its accompanying um, ideology, which is formalism, which if you go back to the, the ism lecture, I talk about that a little bit, was Clement Greenberg. Okay, so Gorky, who has one foot in biomorphic uh, surrealism, his work becomes increasingly uh, non-representational and kind of is the forerunner leading into the kind of abstraction that becomes abstract expressionism. So that's why we have him here as kind of a bridge figure. Okay, so um, Clement Greenberg is born in 1909. He dies in 1994. He is a critic and a writer. He's a formalist um, aesthetician. Um, he started writing as a critic of the theater mostly, but he is definitely most well known for his work in um, visual arts criticism. So, uh, basically, he's particularly associated with what we now call the New York School of Abstract Expressionism, and we're going to talk about a lot of those people today. Um, this is work that is formal in nature, but it also expresses the artist's state of mind. So it kind of has a foot in formalism, that's its dominant foot, I would say, and then it also has a foot in expressionism, uh, depending on which area of the movement we're looking at. We'll look at a couple different things. Um, but the emphasis is on the visual elements, not the subject matter. And again, emotional content being subject matter and the emphasis being there is kind of how we define expressionism. So it's a little bit tricky of a thing because it has expressive qualities about it. Expressionism is in the name, but it's really the first um, movement that's almost entirely grounded in formalism. Um, so the, and there's, there's few, if any, um, traces of representational art left in the work. There's a few exceptions there. We'll look at the de Kooning's and, and they both are um, kind of portrait artists in a unique form of portraiture. Um, with abstract, within abstract expressionism, there are different kinds of painting. We have action painting, we have um, gestural abstraction, we have color field painting, we have soak stain painting, we have first wave, we have second wave, but all of these phases of painting, all these kinds of painting, emphasize the visual um, the visual elements of the work as the primary content of the work. And this guy, Clement Greenberg, was very instrumental in bringing that about. In my notes for this, I have linked a PDF of his, um, probably his most famous essay. He has a lot of famous essays, but it's called The Avant-Garde and Kitsch, and you are welcome to read it. Um, it lays down a lot of his ideas. Basically, he says the avant-garde is a product of the Enlightenment's revolution of critical thinking, while kitsch 
is the product of industrialization and is just a filler for the consumption of the working class. So he's a little snobby, like a lot of art critics at this time are. But, but basically, what does that mean? What it means is he's talking about the avant-garde, which in his mind, the kind of epitome and peak of American avant-garde is abstract expressionism, and how that comes from a place of intellectual critical thinking like when we we talk about the enlightenment okay so he's saying that the the true avant-garde the true interesting um intellectual artwork being made is the avant-garde and that in america is abstract expressionism whereas kitsch which do you know kitsch kitsch i think of like um like tchotchkes it, it's kind of like tacky little like um mass-produced tchotchkes type things um Poster art, art that you can buy pre-stretched at like Target or Hobby Lobby or something, that's kitsch, okay? So um, he's talking about how kitsch basically is just this consumable. It's not made for any um, higher exercise in thought or critical thinking. So that's the distinction that he's drawing in this um, in this essay that was, that was very kind of important to the development of um, the formalist aesthetic. Um, he also really emphasizes the flatness of the picture plane and how that is important and being aware of that as a painter that you're painting on a flat surface is important. We've talked about how that's kind of a growing idea starting way back with 19th century realism, but that is something that uh, Greenberg definitely emphasizes as being very important. And also he writes a lot about medium specificity. So making work that is that you utilizes the right materials and is um, aware of the materials being used. That makes sense. Okay. All right. Let's talk about some art. So Lee Krasner. Uh, Lee Krasner is born in 1908 and dies in 1984. Um, and she's extremely important um, in terms of the development of abstract expressionism. And as more and more research is being done about the women artists of this time, we kind of see increasingly that they were really, really important. And here I'm going to pitch a book, which I haven't done to you yet this semester, Ninth Street Women. This is a really, really good book. You can see my million uh, post-it notes and, and notes and things on it. Very good book. And um, the people that it really focuses on are Lee Krasner, Elaine de Kooning, Helen Frankenthaler, and Grace Hardigan and how their contributions to the trajectory of American art, particularly American avant-garde painting, are critical. So, Lee Krasner is really important, so we're going to talk about her for a minute. Um, basically, she's not only one of the earliest American artists to dabble in non-objective abstraction, as you can see in this painting here from 1942, um, she's also one of the leading voices and organizers among the New York school and the very early New York school. So she wasn't just a painter, she was kind of a leadership figure who helped organize people. Um, she worked under famed artist and professor Hans Hoffmann, um, who was very influential to the development of the ideas and the techniques in the New York school. We're gonna mention Hans Hoffmann quite a bit. Um, and, and he kind of considered her, he was very critical of her work when she talks about him. She says he was quite rough on her when she was his pupil, but he talks about her as kind of his star pupil who came out um, of his tutelage. So um, in an article once that's published about uh, Hans Hoffmann and his contributions to modern art, this is while he's still alive, it, it lists Jackson Pollock, who you've all probably heard of. We're going to talk about him a lot today. He's one of the more famous artists of all time, possibly the most famous American artist of all time. Um, so it lists in this article that comes out, I think it was in Life magazine, uh, but it, it lists Jackson Pollock as one of Hans Hoffman's pupils. And Hoffman sees this article and he comments and says, Pollock was not my student, he was the student of my student, Lee Krasner. So he and uh, several other art historians and people at the time credit Krasner a lot with the development of action painting and, and Jackson Pollock's style in general. So not only does she have contributions to her own art, but also in the organization and, and education of her fellow artists of the time, particularly Jackson Pollock, who is also her husband. I will, spoiler alert, talk to you about that in a second. Um, so 
she also, she knows, she writes some and she's kind of in the mix with all these people. She knows a, a lot of the critics and she introduces Clement Greenberg to Hans Hoffman and to Hans Hoffman's theories, which are largely what Greenberg bases his ideas about formalism and the American avant-garde on. So she connects those two, which is also extremely important to the history of art. Um, she went to the Women's Art School of Cooper Union. Cooper Union is kind of an important uh, college to a lot of the um, American artists from about the 1940s onward. Um, she also went to the National Academy of Design. And then in 1937, she starts taking classes from Hans Hoffmann, who emphasizes the two-dimensional nature of the picture plane. Sound familiar? That's one of the things that Clement Greenberg really emphasized. Greenberg gets that from Hoffman through Krasner's introduction. Um, during these lessons, she was kind of working in basically an advanced style of uh, cubism called neo-cubism. And then she sort of develops her own style out of that. Um, at the first American Artist Congress in 1936, Krasner and her allies asserted that artists could be politically involved without producing propaganda. So she's very vocal in um, arts related politics as well. She later joins the American Abstract Artist Group. She was a leader in the early development of American modernism in a lot of these organized ways. Uh, Piet Mondrian, who we talked about um, in relation to De Style, if you remember, um, he was a fan of her work and he once told her you have a very strong inner rhythm. You must never lose it. So she's she's kind of a painter's painter, basically. Um, she joins the Works Progress Administration's Federal Art Project in uh, 1935. And in this, she does some, some mural painting. So this is one of the relief efforts that's put out to help stabilize artists during um, the aftermath of the Great Depression, which if you look at my notes on the Great Depression, I talk about these different federal relief um, works. She not only signed up for that, she helped a lot of other artists get involved in that uh, program so that they had money so that they could make work and also like, you know, eat and pay rent. Um, and this is when she gets very involved with the, the artist union. Uh, when she starts her relationship with Jackson Pollock, she does not stop working completely on her own work, but she does shift her focus to his career. She was kind of, for all intents and purposes, his manager in a lot of ways. Um, she thought, in her words, she had a much, she had much more to give with his art than she had with hers. So despite all her accomplishments, she's a little insecure about her own work, and is always kind of advocating for other artists, predominantly advocating for Jackson Pollock. Um, Krasner's training with Hans Hoffmann was very influential to Jackson Pollock. Um, his initial approach was based on his training with Thomas Hart Benton, who we talked about when we talked about regionalism. And from Thomas Hart Benton, he gets some sense of color and ideas about rhythm and dynamism in work, but he doesn't have um, the theoretical basis of um, of formalism that Krasner has from Hoffman. And she is who teaches him these ideas and teaches him really about abstraction and abstraction in painting. Um, she also introduces him to Jackson Pollock to other artists, collectors, and critics like Clement Greenberg, who was a huge champion of Jackson Pollock throughout his career, and of Peggy, Peggy Guggenheim, who's a major arts patron and collector, and at this time has a gallery um, she was Pollock's biggest uh, patron throughout his career, and she also introduces him to the de Kooning's, who we'll talk about later, and they're great friends and, and have quite an influence, a mutual uh, influence between Willem de Kooning and Jackson Pollock. So, Krasner's work is important in and of its own right, and all the work that she does on her own, but she's also super important in the careers of a lot of other artists at this time, and in sort of establishing the grouping of artists that become the New York School. Okay, let's look at Lee Krasner's husband. Uh, so, this is Jackson Pollock. He's born in 1912, he dies in 1956. He's born in a small town in Wyoming. Uh, 
Um, his mother, Stella, moved him and his four brothers to California when he's, I think he was just a baby when they moved. Um, they live, I forget exactly where they live, maybe in Chico or something. They live in Southern California and um, eventually are in kind of the greater Los Angeles area. Um, and in Los Angeles, he's expelled from several high schools, the last of which is the Manual Arts High School. So he was kind of a troublemaker. He was kind of a, a uh, he had a bit of a misspent youth, and he was very good at getting kicked out of school. <laughs> so, um, in 1930, when he's 18, he moves with his brother Charles, who is also an artist. They move all the way across the country to New York City. Um, there, he studies with Thomas Hart Benton, as you know, I talked about that a little bit in Regionalism, um, and that is at the Art Students League. In 1936, he is introduced to the use of liquid paint by a um, Mexican muralist named David Alfaro Sequeiros. So they were doing um, work, they were both doing work for the WPA and they were working on a mural together. And he is introduced to the possibility of using liquid like paint that you would paint a house with that's very fluid for mural work. And it hadn't occurred to him that that type of paint could be used in a fine arts um, arena before, right? So that's pretty important, and we'll tuck that away. Um, from 1938 to 1942, he works for the WPA Federal Art Project, just like Lee Krasner, just like a lot of artists, particularly in New York in this time period. Um, in 1942, he meets Krasner at the uh, Macmillan Gallery, where they were both in an exhibition. They both had work in an exhibition, and that's where they first meet. She introduces him to Peggy Guggenheim, who signed him to her gallery in 1943. Um, Guggenheim then commissioned him to paint a huge mural in her house. Marcel Duchamp, who we've also talked about in connection with Dada and Surrealism, and in the notes you can see he's also in the Armory show, he's migrated over to, the, to New York to avoid the war. Very instrumental guy. So Marcel Duchamp, who kind of hangs out with the different artists and thus knows Jackson Pollock, he suggests to him when Peggy Guggenheim commissions this big mural in her house, he's like, well, don't paint it on her wall, just paint it on a really big canvas. And that way it's, it, it moves. So, you know, she's a rich lady. If she moves to a different house, she can take it with her. So that's the first time he works on canvas of, of the size that he becomes accustomed to working on, which is if you've ever been to a museum and seen a Jackson Pollock this one is actually semi-small, seven by 10 feet. He has gigantic canvases. Um, so that's the first time he has that idea. So he kind of is picking up these little bits of information from people. Um, Krasner then introduced Greenberg and Jackson Pollock, um, but the mural at Guggenheim's house is the first work that Greenberg sees in person. So he goes, he sees this work, and he later says that he took one look at it and decided that Jackson Pollock was the greatest American, the greatest painter America had ever produced. And he writes that later. He's, as I said, a huge, Greenberg really pushes Jackson Pollock and is very instrumental to his uh, career. Krasner and Pollock are married in 1945. Uh, they then moved to Springs, New York, which is on uh, Long Island, which is kind of a little more, there's more space. It's not urban. It's not like in the city. So they buy this old house that like, doesn't have heat or plumbing, they have to do all this work to it, but it has a big barn and they have more space. So her studio is in the house and then they convert this big barn into his studio. Um, and this is where he perfects his, his method that he's famous for, which is called drip painting. It's also called sometimes action painting, which is what he's, this kind of work that we're looking at. So he finally has enough space to work in this manner that he becomes quite famous for. Um, so how he does this is he lays his canvas out on the floor of the barn and then he walks over it with paint in a, in a can that he is taking a stick and flinging and dripping. He also uses a brush directly. Um, so this is when he's finally able to develop this work. So he has kind of the, the elements he gathers all over time, theory from Krasner, liquid paint from um, the muralist that he works with, the large-scale canvas from Guggenheim and Duchamp's contribution, and then he just needs the space, and once he has it, it all kind of, bam, clicks together, and we have the birth of Jackson Pollock as we know his work now.
1956, Time Magazine called him Jack the Dripper because of his uh, drip painting technique. He hated that nickname. I think it's kind of funny. Um, and then in 1950, a young photographer and videographer called um, Hans Namath comes, asks if he can come out and photograph Jackson working in his studio, and he finally agrees. And so these are quite famous um, photos and videos we have of Jackson Pollock working in his studio, and we see how engaged and uh, in the action of the work he is, and how he kind of becomes, he, he kind of goes into the painting to work on it. So this is a huge breakthrough in American painting. No one's seen anything like this before. It causes a huge rumble in the art world. People don't know what to think about it. We find we have something that's totally divorced from representation and we're in full non-objective painting. Okay. What are other artists doing at this time? There are lots of artists that are affiliated with the New York School and this uh, artist is prime among them. We have Willem de Kooning. He's born in 1904. Uh, he dies in 1997. Um, and he is famous for the gestural abstract style. So he sees the kind of work that um, Krasner is doing. He sees this, this action painting, this kind of drip work that Jackson Pollock is doing. And he's very interested in these ideas about kind of liberating um, the movement of the brush on the canvas. So he takes gestural abstract style, which is something that we think about with Jackson Pollock's drip paintings and flinging paint, but instead of working on the floor, he's still working on the easel. So he takes this to where it's um, vertical and starts making these kind of motions with the brush on the canvas. Process is very important to de Kooning. Process is also quite important to Pollock and Krasner. That's kind of a common thread in the artists of abstract expressionism and the New York School, is that the process of making the painting is as important, if not more important, than the final resulting painting. Okay. Um, he's also very influenced by his wife, Elaine de Kooning. Um, she's originally his student, and they have a mutual back and forth um, with their work. Um, he was born in Rotterdam uh, in the Netherlands. He actually comes to the United States as a stowaway on a ship, um, and he moves to the U.S. in 1926. Um, he marries Elaine de Kooning in 1943. So um, he is someone who is definitely kind of a different kind of action painting, right? He's not walking around flinging paint, but he is very um, aggressively kind of attacking the painting, the canvas with his brush. Um, he's also highly influenced by Arshild Gorky. They are good friends and have a lot of um, documented discussions and letters about um, the, about style. They, they talked quite a bit about painting. Um, he joins the Artist Union in 1934 and so he's also very involved in all these kind of um, art-centric gatherings and organizations in New York. Um, you can see some similarities here. So here's Willem de Kooning and here's his wife Elaine de Kooning. Um, so you can tell they're working in the same space. They're working in their studio, which is their apartment. Um, sometimes they would prioritize buying paint over buying food. They were very, very poor. The, the starving artist thing comes in strong in the New York school at this time. Um, so Elaine de Kooning, let's talk about her. She's born in 1918. She dies in 1981. Um, she went to Hunter College, and then she goes to um, Leon Leonardo da Vinci School, which is also in New York, in uh, 1937. Um, she then goes to the American Artist School, um, where she she's, again, like kind of starving at this time as an artist. And the way she supported herself and got all this education was going to school was she had a job as a model for the art school. So she would go take the classes and then she'd turn around and go be the nude model for the drawing and painting classes. And that's how she paid her way through school. Um, she meets Willem de Kooning in 1938 when her teacher introduces them. They're at a diner in New York and she really wanted to meet him. She was a huge fan of his work before meeting him. Um, and so then she, after she meets him, she talks him into giving her painting and drawing lessons. Um, he was 34 and she was 20 at the time. They then get married a few years later in 1943. 
Um, she was one. She was one of the only women who was in what was called the Eighth Street Club. This was a group of artists who would get together, kind of like Gertrude Stein's salons in New York, except or in Paris rather, except a little more formalized. And they would meet to discuss ideas about art. Um, they were at a show in 1951 called Man and Wife, which was um, married couples who were both artists. This show also featured Lee Krasner and Jackson Pollock. Um, later, the women who were in the show kind of had, it left a little bit of a bad taste in their mouth because it seemed like the main emphasis was on the men as being the painters and then, oh look, the wife plays with painting too. It, it was kind of a, it was a little bit more problematic than they thought it was going into it, but it is a pretty significant show art historically. It has all these major painter, painting, blah, blah, painters in it. Um, in 1954, she has her first solo exhibition at Stable Gallery. In 1948, she began writing for Art News, and she ends up writing over a hundred articles for Art News, which is this publication at the time that was quite important. She did lots of um, reviews of shows. She wrote as an art critic, um, and she is the first American artist to also take on the role of an art critic. So um, that was kind of a thing that was fairly divided. It's like if you were an artist, you didn't write about other people's work necessarily. You didn't write in a professional capacity as an art critic, but she did. So she's one of the first people to do that. Um, she also teaches art eventually at a number of different colleges. Um, and she, I love this quote from her, and I think it really epitomizes what was happening with the New York school and with gestural abstraction at this time. She says, a painting to me is primarily a verb, not a noun an event first and only secondarily an image. So in that, again, we're talking about the fact that the process is very important, that the act of painting and how you are painting and what materials you are using become the most important part of the work. Um, she's known in gestural abstraction for doing very abstract loose portraiture like this. This is what she does her entire career. She does very few works that are um, completely non-representational, and she quite famously, and one of you wrote about this, is writing about this for the discussion, she did um, JFK's presidential portrait. So each president has an official portrait. Elaine de Kooning does JFK's. She's the first woman to do, um, and maybe still like actually the only woman to do a presidential commissioned portrait, um, and it's the first abstract, really stylized kind of portrait that is done, which is a pretty huge deal. Um, so that's a, a major commission. Um, the important thing with both of the de Kooning's is their use of gestural mark making, which again you can see when you look at how they're both treating the figure and treating the paint in their work, you can see the connections there. They take the idea of gestural painting from Jackson Pollock strip paintings and they apply it in a vertical orientation on an easel. So that's very important to um, the direction of abstraction at this time. Okay. Um, on the de Kooning's and Jackson Pollock and the New York School in general, critic Harold Rosenberg, who's also kind of a part of this group, he's one of the, the um, writers who kind of hangs around with all these guys. He says, uh, he writes in 1952, at a certain moment, the canvas began to appear to one American painter after another as an arena in which to act, rather than as a space in which to reproduce, redesign, analyze, or express an object, actual or imagined. What was to go on the canvas was not a picture, but an event. So that's very similar to what Lee Krasner is saying um, about painting being a verb, not a noun. So other critics pick up on this theme in the work that's happening at this time, and that's where we get ideas about action painting and this idea that gestural abstraction is this very active kind of work that's being done within abstract expressionism at the time. This is Joan Mitchell. Uh, Joan Mitchell is born in 1925. Um, she dies in 1992. And she definitely embodies this idea of the event of painting. I mean, as much as Pollock or de Kooning, either of the de Koonings, um, she's kind of the embodiment in my mind of gestural abstraction. Um, 
and I'm talking a lot about each of these people. I'll try to like contain this a little bit so this isn't the longest lecture of all time. But uh, let's just jump to her talking about her work. So um, when asked in an interview to define her technique and style, she said, abstract is not a style. I simply want to make surface work. This is just a use of space and form. It's an ambivalence of forms and space. Style in painting has to do with labels. Lots of painters are obsessed with inventing something. When I was young, it never occurred to me to invent. All I wanted to do was paint. And so here we see that she's sort of the, um, the anti-manifesto, right? We've seen up to this point a lot of artists writing these manifestos that are all about their ideas and their intentions. And Joan Mitchell really just kind of cuts that off and is like, that's not what I do. What I do is paint. And she is the embodiment of a formalist. She's interested in putting the paint on the canvas. That's it. That's what she's doing. It's about color. It's about form. It's about the composition. It's about the surface area. That's it. That's, that's what she does. And she's very straightforward and no nonsense about this. She spends a lot of her career in New York, but she also spends a great part of her life and her career working in Paris. And she's one of the artists who kind of brings the ideas of abstract expressionism and the New York school across the pond into Paris pretty directly. Okay, uh, Grace Hardigan. Grace Hardigan is born in 1922. She dies in 2008. Um, she's another important member of the New York school. She moved to New York City in 1945, and she kind of fell in immediately with uh, this group, the kind of Ninth Street area artistic community, which is where all, uh, most of these abstract expressionist types were sort of collected. Um, Clement Greenberg selected her for the New Talent exhibition at the Kunst Gallery in 1950. So she's snatched up by important people in this um, arena pretty quickly and, and picked out as one of the rising stars of the movement. She was also included in the major exhibition 12 Americans at the MoMA in the MoMA is the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1956. She was the only woman included in that show. And she was also the only woman who's included in the very famous New American Painters show. And this is an exhibition which um, was put together partially by the U.S. government. And it is sent to Europe and tours Europe. It goes all around Europe. I forget how many cities. I think eight different cities or something from 1958 to 1959, exhibiting what's happening in the new American avant-garde. And so she's the only woman selected for that exhibition as well. So she is quite important and quite groundbreaking um, in terms of gender roles in um, art history. She's kind of hard to ignore because she was in all these big exhibitions. And you can see in her work, it kind of takes what's happening with de Kooning here and this idea of the um, verticalization of the gestural work coming from Pollock and it loosens it up in a way where we see how there could be some relation maybe still to representation to something that she's seen but it's very abstract and she's applying the paint in different kinds of ways that are very painterly, very gestural, and very um, expressive. Okay, this is just an installation show shot of an exhibition called The Ninth Street Show, which featured a lot of the artists that I've just talked about. As I said, they all kind of had studios and lived around 8th and 9th Street in New York. And so this was an exhibition about people who were working that was, or that was artist organized at the time. Okay, let's go into some different areas that develop out of this initial abstract expressionism. We have post painterly abstraction, we have color field painting, and we have soak stain painting. Okay, this is uh, Barnett Newman. He's born in 1905, he dies in 1970. Um, so he kind of stands in contrast, like let's just look at him compared to say Hardigan. So here's another red painting by Hardigan. Here's a red painting by Newman, painted around the same time, very, very different, right? So in contrast to the aggressive energetic images of the gestural abstractionists, so all the people that we were just looking at, we have work like this, like this piece from Barnett Newman that is um, being developed simultaneous to these more um, intense kind of aggressive gestural works. Um, and sort of 
similarly, we also at this time have Mark Rothko, who we'll, we'll talk about next. And they, they do work, they have different kinds of techniques and, and applications, but their work is um, sort of similar in, in, in its static kind of feeling. So Newman, he's a very interesting guy. He's fascinated by a lot of different things two of which, which he says are very influential in his art, he's fascinated by biology and he's fascinated by Native American art. I myself find the threads of those two influences a little bit hard to find in his work, but I like to include, you know, the artist's own words about, about their work. Um, he's known for creating these very large color field paintings like this one. This is 17 feet long. It's a very imposing canvas. It's quite large. Um, and he divides these paintings by these uh, vertical lines, which he calls zips. So if you ever read anything about him talking about his work and he's talking about zips, he's talking about these vertical lines that divide his, his big swaths of color. In his words, the streak was always going through an atmosphere. I kept trying to create a world around it. Um, so his intention was for the zips or the streaks to kind of energize the color field that they created. So he thought that by imposing these different colors, oftentimes fairly analogous colors, and then you'll have like one or two that are really high contrast. The idea he had was that this would energize and create this dynamic kind of balance. Who else was interested in using seemingly simple methodologies to create dynamic balance and energize their paintings? Piet Mondrian, who we talked about in the style. So this isn't exactly a new idea, but it's being applied in a different sort of way. And as this is happening in the greater context of gestural abstraction, you can see how this is kind of a wild, this is kind of wild work to see come onto the scene. Okay, Mark Rothko. Mark Rothko was born in 1903. He dies in 1970. So Newman, who we were just looking at, once said he was using color to express his feelings about the tragic conditions of modern life. And no one understood this motion, this idea of using color to express the tragic conditions of modern life. No one understood that better than Mark Rothko. That's also what Rothko is very much about. Um, he's also interested in universal themes and especially in universal themes that relate to tragedy. Um, he was born in Russia, but he moved to the U.S. when he's a child. And basically, he thought that representation of anything from the physical world, anything that you can see or sense in the physical world, in his paintings would conflict with his sublime vision of the universal. He talks a lot about the sublime and the universal in his work. And he, kind of like the spiritualists and the people interested in theosophy, kind of like Kandinsky and those guys, he thought that bringing in things from the actual world would sort of taint his paintings and taint their their sublime sort of um, meditative quality, essentially. He said of himself and of Newman, uh, they wrote several statements about their work together, we favor the simple expression of the complex thought, which I think is a very nice summation of color field painting. So the ideas behind it and the emotional qualities and, and sort of universal truths that they were interesting, interested in expressing are very complicated and are very conceptual, but they sought to express them in the most simplified way possible, which is much harder than it sounds. I think that there's um, difficulty in simplicity, particularly in visual art. Um, he... He's kind of like, you could draw a comparison to the phobes, right? When we talked about phobism and how Matisse talked about color being the primary conveyor of meaning. That's also what Rothko thinks. That's also what Newman thinks. They believe in color as the primary conveyor of meaning, but they believe in it so much so that they think any other elements are kind of a distraction. So color, it really has to be parred down to where color is the primary force. Rothko is another painter, as are many of the painters we're looking at in this particular module. It just doesn't do any justice to see them 
as a slide. You have to see them in person. Um, they're a totally different experience. In Texas, we have the Rothko Chapel. If you ever have an opportunity to visit it, it's a very meditative, very interesting space to be in. Anytime you're in a museum that has a major modern wing, there'll generally be at least one Rothko. He was quite prolific. Go if you can and just sit and zone out at, and stare at one of these things for a while. I was I didn't get Rothko until I'd taken time to really sit down and stare at one for a long time. But they're they're quite beautiful and they're they're pretty amazing. His his grasp of color theory was incredible. When you see one of these in person, all the subtleties and nuance and the color, particularly around the edges and the borders, it's not expressible in a uh, slide. So definitely don't write him off until you've looked at a couple of his in person. Um, this particular painting I chose to show you because it has sort of an interesting story. Um, well, first I skipped one of my other lines that I love from him. He saw color, Rothko saw color as a doorway to another reality, which I think is a really nice sentiment. Okay, so this painting, the story behind it, is it's acquired by the MoMA, the Museum of Modern Art in New York, and it's purchased by them in 1950 when it's painted. This is very early, right? So this was considered purchasing something that was part of abstract expressionism as par part of the permanent collection was considered so radical at that time that one of the museum's board of trustee members resigned from the board because they bought this painting because they were so upset by it it was considered such a radical act so that's kind of a little context for you about what's going on at this time in the art world in new york okay now we come into what is considered post-painterly abstraction. And that's a hard line to draw. I kind of put Newman and Rothko in that line as well, but a lot of people really start that division with soak stain painting. So, post-painterly abstraction. This is Helen Fa Frankenthaler. This is my favorite artist of all time. I only included this one painting of hers and I will not talk about her for hours, which I have a tendency to do when someone brings up Frankenthaler, so I will contain myself, I promise. Uh, she is born in 1928. She dies in 2011. She invented soak stain painting, which is a technique and a process that um, becomes quite important to um, post-painterly abstraction, and we're going to talk about what that means in a minute. Um, and she developed this variation on color field painting. It's also sometimes just called staining, but soak stain painting is, is the technique. Um, so let's talk about her life a little bit. She had a very privileged upbringing. Her dad was a New York State Supreme Court judge, so she was quite wealthy. She was able to go to the best schools. Um, she studied art at the Dalton School, and then she goes on to uh, Bennington College. Um, she graduates from there. Um, this painting, is her big break. It is her her technological breakthrough painting. Um, I got to see this painting in person for the first time. It's at the Smithsonian in DC. And I got to see it in person for the first time um, a year or so ago when I was at a conference. And it's it was kind of a fangirl moment for me in terms of art history. I've seen tons of Helen Frankenthaler's work. I love her work. But seeing this in person was a big deal. For me personally. Um, okay, so she's another artist who's a process artist. And what that process is, the process she is most known for, soak stain painting, is you take raw, meaning unprimed canvas, sometimes stretched, sometimes not stretched, and you roll it out on the floor and you take paint, usually oil paint, sometimes uh, people do it with acrylic as well, that you dilute down um, with water or oil, uh, linseed oil, depending on what kind of paint you're using. Um, you can also add a little dish soap to it to really break the binders and the paint. And then you pour that paint directly onto the raw canvas so it makes a mark as it initially hits the, the canvas, but then as it soaks in, it spreads. It also, as it dries, it evaporates and soaks up through from the floor and makes kind of a haloing effect sometimes, which you can control by pressing the canvas down. So the resulting work is a true partnership between the artist and the medium they are working with because you can't completely control it. So you can control it to a degree, but because you're working on unprimed canvas, it has it, it has some serendipity to it. There, You can't 100% control it. 
And she's the first person to really do this and to really explore this work. She gets the idea and she's very influenced by Jackson Pollock and his drip painting, his action painting, and this idea of painting on the floor. But her idea is to use the liquidity of the paint even more directly in the way that she is working so that it is actually the act of staining the work. It's kind of like dyeing the work with the paint, dyeing the canvas, the material with the paint is really where the mark making comes in. So this is a totally um, new method and a new idea. Um, she also studies privately with uh, Hans Hoffmann, who we've talked about quite a few times. He's very influential and a lot of his ideas kind of um, are the basis of Greenberg's ideas about formalism. Um, so she graduates from college in 1949 and then she starts working directly with Hans Hoffmann. Um, she was in a relationship with Clement Greenberg for about five years. Um, and later she marries fellow abstract expressionist Robert Motherwell. It doesn't work out, they get divorced after a while. But anyway, she's very much in with the, the, the New York school and with the painters and critics who are working at this time in abstract expressionism. She much later goes on to teach. She teaches at um, Hunter College. Um, but basically, her big contribution is this idea of soak stain painting and the way to use the media in such a direct way that it's literally post painterly. It's literally post painting painting. Okay, I'll, I'll stop talking about her. Uh, Morris Lewis. Okay. He is born in 1912. He dies in 1962. Um, so when I was studying art history a million years ago, Morris Lewis is who we learned about as a post painterly abstract painter. And he is who we were told invented this idea of painting on raw canvas and staining the fabric of the canvas with paint. So until uh, much later <laughs> on my own kind of discovery, um, I did not know that that kind of technique and work was invented by a woman. I thought it was invented by this guy. Um, I love his paintings. I think his paintings are gorgeous and brilliant. But he came up with the idea to paint this way because Clement Greenberg brought Morris Lewis to Helen Frankenthaler's studio. Um, and then she demonstrated for him how she was painting uh, with the soak stain technique on raw unprimed canvas. So as beautiful as his work is, and as, you know, important and valid as it is, he did not invent this. <laughs> so let's make sure that we make a note of that. And, and as your art history teacher, I don't want to mislead you the way I was misled. Um, so he used the method of pouring diluted paint onto the surface of unprimed canvas like Frankenthaler. Sometimes he did this on the ground, and sometimes he did it where he had it elevated but not... Um, completely vertical. He would put it as an angle so it would kind of like stream down the surface and then he would flip it the other way and pour paint from the other direction. Um, so he altered the technique somewhat. It wasn't just flat on the floor. Um, this particular painting is from a series of work of his called the Veils paintings. I think it is far and away his best work. Um, and they're just gorgeous. The way he uses color is very interesting. He also, rather than using oil, which is predominantly what Frankenthaler used, he uses acrylic resin. So he is taking this technique and introducing new kinds of media to it to achieve slightly different kinds of looks. Okay, so basically Frankenthaler and Lewis both reduce the act of painting they reduce it down to pigment imbued fa fabric, to soaking a fabric with a pigment. And that is what kind of the ultimate reduction of painting until we get to minimalism and we talk about Ryman and we see <laughs> this may be further reduced. Okay, so that's Morris Lewis. Alma Thomas. Um, this work is not typical of all of her work. She does a lot of work that looks almost aboriginal in origin or sort of like a take on mosaic because he's kind of like um, abstracted dot paintings but this is a kind of work that fits in very much with this post painterly idea and it's important I think uh, in the lineage of painting and she's just a fascinating um, character from art history she's just a fascinating woman so I want to talk about her for a little bit 
She is born in 1891. She dies in 1978. So she's older than a lot of the painters in this time period. She went to Howard in 1921, Howard College or Howard University, where she initially went in with the intent of um, studying home ec. This is 1921. That's a pretty reasonable thing for a woman to study if she's going to deign to go to college. Uh, and after she's there, she switches her major from home ec to fine arts, and she graduates um, in 1924 with a degree in fine arts. She had previously gone to what is called a normal school, I forget which one, and gotten her teaching certificate. So teaching colleges were originally called normal schools. I don't remember why that is the name, but here in Springfield, Missouri State University was originally the normal school because it was a teaching college. Anyway, she had a teaching certificate. She went to Howard. Uh, for a four-year degree in fine arts. She then goes on uh, to earn her master's degree in arts education, and this is at Columbia University in 1934. A woman getting a master's degree in America at this time is fairly unusual. An African-American woman getting a master's degree at this time is very unusual. She's actually at Columbia University at the same time as my grandmother, my grandmother had a master's degree at a time when that was very unusual for women. She was a pretty unusual woman. And they were there at the same time, which I didn't know while my grandmother was still alive, or I would have asked her if they knew each other because that would be pretty rad. Anyway, she goes to Columbia University, a very prestigious school, by the way, in New York, and she gets her master's degree in arts education. Um, they were in different fields, but still. Maybe they knew each other. That'd be pretty cool. I like to think that they were buddies. I just kind of make up this fanfic in my head. Anyway, uh, so she's a teacher. So she teaches. That is her career. She retires from teaching in 1960. And that's when she starts taking classes in her retirement um, at American University in D.C. Here is where she learns about the developing movement color field painting as part of abstract expressionism. And she becomes super interested in these ideas about color and composition as uh, sort of separated from um, representationalism. So she starts thinking about composition and color in terms of color field painting, which she's just kind of learned about at this late age when she's retired. And she starts making really dynamic, interesting work like this piece, Red Abstraction, at this time. Critics were really taken with her work. She was very favorably received. Um, by the kind of art world, the art, art critics at the time. She did receive criticism, however, because this is the 1960s, from other African-American artists, particularly young African-American artists who are producing works about social protest, about the civil rights movement, right, at this time. And so they sort of questioned her blackness. Um, she received some kind of harsh criticism about making this abstract work rather than work that focused on social justice. When asked about this, she says, the use of color in my paintings is of paramount importance to me. Through color, I have sought to concentrate on beauty and happiness in my painting rather than man's inhumanity to man. So her response is essentially that her work is political in that she is focusing her work on beauty and color and composition rather than dating to portray the ugliness of racism. So she's talking about color in a way that's significant um, and, and is kind of, she's one of the first people to talk about that essentially and saying that I am making a choice and the choice of what I portray or don't portray is political and is my, my focus in my work. It's kind of, it goes back, if you go back to the beginning of this lecture when I'm talking about Lee Krasner and her assertion that work does not have to be propaganda to be political. Alma Thomas kind of embodies that sentiment many years later, like 20 years later. Okay, she's the first African-American woman to have a solo show at the Whitney Museum of Art in New York. That's one of the major museums in New York. And she has a solo exhibition while she is still living, which is a huge deal. There's also been uh, retrospectives of her work at this point. But she's pretty important, and she's she's kind of rad to me. Like, she really broke a lot of boundaries and kind of epitomizes, like, the American dream in the art sense of really just going for it, even though she's retired, even though she had obstacles against her. Okay, so let's talk about, I promise I'm almost done. I know this is long. This is another giant of post-painterly um, abstraction, and that's Ellsworth Kelly. 
Um, he's born in 1923. He dies in 2015. Um, he studied at Pratt in Brooklyn, um, and then he goes to École des Beaux Arts in Paris, which we of course have heard École des Beaux Arts a lot. It's still it's very famous um, fine arts academy in Paris. Um, his emphasis on pure form and color, and his suppression of gesture. You don't see any gesture getting through here. It looks like something I just made on my computer. I promise it is actually a painting. Um, basically, he's just trying to create spatial unity. He doesn't want gesture to, to leak in at all. Um, and that's very important in the development of abstract painting in America to totally remove any like painterly kind of work. Even he even goes so far as saying that work like uh, Frankenthaler and Morris soak stain painting is still too painterly because you can see the way the paint is impacting the canvas. He tries to make his work look like something a machine made even though he is painting it. Okay the last person we'll we'll talk about is Frank Stella um, and he could easily fit into the next lecture which is we could put him in with the minimalist. Some people even could make an argument to put him in with the op artist. Uh, he's born in 1936, and he's still alive. We've made it, students. We've made it to the point in our class where we are finally talking about an artist who is not dead. So here we are with Frank Stella, who is 84 years old, still kicking it in Massachusetts, um, still with us today. He is the forerunner of post-painterly abstraction, um, the subgroup of post-painterly abstraction that we call hard edge painting. So there's a lot of little subgroups in here and if you look up hard edge painting, Frank Stella is the probably the first name that you will see. Um, he has a degree in history from Princeton, which is kind of interesting. So he went to an Ivy League school and studied history and then decided he wanted to be a painter. Um, he moved to New York in 1958. He, he was aware of all the other abstract expressionists and what they were doing, but he was not particularly interested in what they were doing. His interest was in eliminating the variables associated with painting. So he was interested definitely in formalism and in Greenbergian uh, modernism and the ideas that are associated with that, but he wanted to skip over any kind of gesture, anything like that, and simplify his compositions and remove any expressive or painterly gesture completely. So he has that in common with Kelly, right? Um, he had a systematic method of painting. Uh, like Greenberg, he too was very interested in the concept of purifying art. Um, and of his work, he very famously said, what you see is what you see. Someone was interviewing him and asking him to explain the meaning or the intent behind his work. And he simply said, what you see is what you see. That's all it is. There's no deeper meaning to it. And that is a good um, segue for our next lecture, which will be on minimalism, post-minimalism, and op art. Okay.